Hi, and welcome to another edition of our Beat Diabetes Books and Quotes series. We're going to continue looking at a few quotes from the book Fat Chance by Dr. Robert Lustig, uh, subtitled Beating the Odds Against Sugar, Processed Food, Obesity, and Disease. Dr. Lustig uh, maybe isn't quite a brother in the low-carb movement in the sense of uh, Dr. Westman and Jason Fung and Ken Berry and so forth, uh, but he's a cousin, good friend of the movement, I guess you could say. Uh, his big major focus is really twofold. Number one, don't eat sugar, uh, which we would all agree with, and number two, eat lots and lots of fiber. Well, of course, fiber is not much of an issue if you're eating an eggs and bacon breakfast. You're not getting any fiber to speak of, but you don't need fiber. <laughs> so depending on uh, how many plant foods you eat, uh, fiber could or could not be relevant. But let's get to a few of the things he has to say in his book, Fat Chance. He writes, if in response to a meal, particularly one in refined carbohydrates, your pancreas makes extra insulin called insulin hypersecretion, it will drive your fat cells to store energy. And basically, they're going to store more fat. They're going to become bigger fat cells and more fat cells because of insulin. Well, doctors have long noted this, that when you give patients more insulin, they tend to gain weight significantly. Some I've heard of go back to their doctor and said, well, doc, you told me to take this insulin and it's helping my blood sugar levels, but I've gained 30 pounds in the last few months. So insulin is uh, something that can cause you to gain weight for sure. He says, if because of the specific foods you eat, you build up fat in your liver, this fat will make the liver sick called insulin resistance. The pancreas has no choice but to make more insulin. So a process begins and the liver gets sick. The liver becomes fat, fatty liver. And uh, as a result, your pancreas has to make more and more insulin. So I can't argue with that. He's absolutely right. Everybody agrees with that. Uh, when you eat high carb meals, high sugar meals, uh, your pancreas has got to go to work. And as a result, you're, it's going to store fat. Now, the one outlier to that whole process is there are some people that eat a lot of carbs and even eat a lot of sugar and they stay skinny. So you may say, well, what's the deal with that? I thought the more carbs and sugars you ate, the more insulin release there is and the fatter you get and you just get fatter and fatter and fatter. Well, I've got a son uh, who's not at all well controlled in his diet and he's skinny. He wishes he could gain more weight and he eats carbs freely and doesn't worry a thing about it. You say, well, why haven't you converted him? Uh, there's a limit to what you can do even with your own family. But uh, he's one of those that just cannot gain weight. And there are some people that way. But unless you are gifted, <laughs> unless you are gifted to where you just can't gain weight any which way, you will tend to gain weight. Now, one of the things he says I wanted to just pick up on for a moment. At the beginning of the quote, he talks about eating a meal in uh, high in refined carbohydrates. And uh, he mentions that several times throughout this book. Refined carbohydrates. Well, I agree that refined carbohydrates are the worst of all, no doubt about it. But it could give you the idea that if you can just eat carbs that are not too refined, you'll be just fine. And that's not true. So some people could say, all right, he says I shouldn't eat refined carbohydrates. I've been eating white rice. I'll start eating brown rice and all will be well. No, probably not. And the same thing is true with his push on fiber. Some people could misunderstand that and say, okay, well, I want to go for the higher fiber, not the lower fiber. Well, yeah, that's true. But uh, sometimes we can get the wrong idea. For example, brown rice has something like three grams of fiber per serving. Not a whole lot. White rice has something like one gram or no grams of fiber per serving. So yeah, if you eat brown rice, you're getting more fiber. But Three grams per serving is just not that much. And the way you can tell that that fiber is not doing you that much good is you test your blood sugar after eating the brown rice versus the white rice, and there's just not that much difference. So sometimes people can read about refined carbohydrates and say, well, there's the secret. I'll give up the refined. No more white bread for me, baby. No more brown rice, uh, white rice for me. It's brown rice and whole wheat bread and all will be well. Well, 
That's an improvement, but it's just not enough. Not nearly enough. All right, let's move on to another quote. He talks about fatty liver and uh, almost everybody that understands and discusses metabolic disease, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, they make reference to fatty liver. It used to be in the old days when you talked about fatty liver or you talked about liver problems, you're talking about an alcoholic. And nowadays there's more people with fatty liver as a result of the way they eat than there are as uh, by the way they drink. Of course, both can do it for you. And he, ma he makes mention of this. He says both alcohol and sugar significantly increase your visceral fat. Visceral fat means fat gathered in your organs and around your organs. He says alcohol and sugar increase your visceral fat and your likelihood of developing associated diseases. The difference between alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease lies only in terminology. The effect on the body are the same. So whether you get your fatty liver from drinking a bunch of whiskey or you get your fatty liver from eating a bunch of donuts and, and bread and rice, uh, either way, it's fatty liver is fatty liver and it's going to have the same effect, which is a, not a good effect. The, the, if there's one organ in the world besides your pancreas, you want to keep lean, mean, healthy, and strong. It's your liver, pancreas and liver. If you keep those two organs in good shape, you'll be in good shape most likely. Obviously, I can't guarantee it, but boy, that's a great start for most people. If you can just have a healthy pancreas and a healthy liver, you're good. But and some diabetics say, all right, I'll cut the carbs, but don't ask me to quit drinking. Well, I've never said much about drinking one way or the other. And uh, an occasional glass of wine is not a big deal. Uh, but if you drink a lot, you're damaging your liver and that liver is not going to work well and it's going to affect your blood sugar as well. So you don't want fatty liver, not by drinking, not by donuts, not by rice, not by bread. You just don't want fatty liver because it's going to affect the whole metabolic system and cause problems. Now, at one point he makes kind of a uh, conclusion and a, a general statement about the answer to all the problems of metabolic syndrome. So he, the, the subheading before he writes this is, so what's the answer? Well, good question. He says, I would propose that all we need to do is eat safe carbs. Makes me a little nervous because it kind of gives you the idea that carbs are not really such a problem. Just eat the safe ones and immediately you start thinking about sweet potatoes and you start thinking about whole grain bread or Ezekiel bread. You start thinking about what's known as the healthy carbs. And he says, we just eat the safe carbs. That means low sugar to prevent insulin resistance. Well, amen to that. Obviously, I would say no sugar. He says low sugar to prevent insulin resistance, high fiber to reduce flux to the liver and prevent insulin hypersecretion. So once again, the emphasis on either low or no sugar and high fiber. And he says, while we're at it, eat safe fat, that is real fat rather than synthetic fat, such as trans fats, which cannot be metabolized. Well, if you're going to eat plant products, you either need to go for the green leafy vegetables like spinach and greens and things like that. The low carb vegetables like broccoli and cauliflower, or if you're going to eat something that's more of a grain or, or it has higher, in car, higher carbs, find some kind of a food that has mostly fiber carbs. Now, I know this gets down to the net carbs concept, and a lot of the keto folks don't like net carbs at all. But it's, they're a little bit hypocritical because a lot of those same keto folks will eat avocados freely. Well, if you eat a single good-sized avocado, you've used up your carbs for the day. You know, it's going to take you up close to 20 grams of carbs. But most of those carbs are fiber carbs. Hence, the net effect is not going to be much on blood sugar. I eat avocados freely. I don't bother them. Mike agrees with them. Mike likes them. So I don't worry about it. Yeah, out of a, a good-sized avocado, you may be getting 18 grams of carbs. But if 14 of those grams are fiber, it's not going to affect blood sugar much. Another example of that is the lupin flour tortillas. One of the ladies, I think it might have been keto focus lady, 
uh, showed how to make a, a lupin flour tortilla. It's a little bit more work than most of the tortillas, but boy, those are good. They taste probably closer to a real tortilla than most of the other substitutes that you can make. And I've got a video on it. Uh, type in lupin flour tortillas or just uh, tortillas. But um, those things have actually quite a bit of fiber. I mean, quite a bit. But it's virtually all fiber. I mean, it's like if you get a, a, a helping of a, a, loop, a good sized lupin flour food, you may have 30 grams of carbs coming from that lupin flour. That's a lot of carbs. I mean, that's a, we're almost at candy bar level. But it's like 28 grams of that are all fiber. Lupin is just almost pure fiber. <laughs> so uh, it doesn't affect blood sugar. It should not. Now, there may be some exceptions. And I know I have people that write and say, oh, this net carbs thing doesn't work for me at all. But for me, I can eat a lupin flour tortilla with maybe 20 some up close to 30 grams of carbs and it doesn't budge the glucose meter. It, it, it doesn't move hardly at all. So, I mean, he's right. Fiber is important if you're going to go with high carb foods. The only way you should ever eat a high carb food is if it has almost all fiber. And flaxseed is another thing. I, uh, or chia seed. I, I make a chia seed pudding. Chia seeds actually are somewhat high in carbs. But almost all those carbs are fiber. Just It's just loaded with fiber. That's not going to affect blood sugar. Might affect, affect how many bowel movements you have, but it's probably not going to affect blood sugar unless you're one of those exceptions. So anyway, his emphasis on being anti-sugar, sugar is bad, sugar is the devil, sugar is villain, I agree completely. Sugar is horrible. There's, there's other ways to sweeten foods or drinks if you need to. And people can argue about uh, whether they're actually healthy for you. But there are other ways to do it, obviously. Stevia, erythritol, Splenda, etc. They will not raise blood sugar much. But sugar, it's like it's the monster. It's the, the thing you should avoid at all costs. The idea of getting a lot of fiber, hardly relevant if you don't eat too many plant foods. Generally, my lunch is where I'll have some low-carb vegetables, but they don't have much carbs to start with, so I don't need to do too much deducting. Anyway, this is by Dr. Robert Lustig. He has a new book out. I'll have to get one of these days called, uh, I think, uh, Metabolic. So, uh, and, and I was thinking about this earlier this morning. You know, people can change. I've changed since the time I began to make these videos, and I've got a few different ideas than I once had. And I can look back at some of my older videos and say, well, I don't agree with that, or you didn't say that very well, or you should have said this. So when I read some of these older books, you have to consider they may even have changed. He may have moved closer <laughs> to the low-carb eating style, or maybe not. I don't know. Anyway, that's it for today. God bless. See you again soon. Did you ever wonder why YouTubers are always asking you to like, share, and comment? It's not really that we're all egotists and we love to have a lot of positive reinforcement. It's because we know that the YouTube algorithm keeps track of these things and rewards videos that have a lot of viewer interaction by promoting them to other people. So when people go to YouTube, they'll find that video near the top of their feed, and in turn, these videos will become more popular still. So if this channel has been a blessing to you, help us out by clicking the thumbs up, making a comment, and sharing it with someone you think might benefit from it. Thank you so much, and God bless you.